Well, hello everyone. I'm Eric Fondi. I'm Preservation Program Manager for the State Historic Preservation Office. For those unfamiliar with our office, it was created from the National Historic Preservation Act in 1966. Every state and territory has one. It, that created the National Register of Historic Places. And among other things, our office is involved with identifying and listing properties on the National Register, as well as having incentives to help developers preserve such places and some compliance. We also do a lot of compliance to help protect those places. Our annual historic preservation conference will be held in Tucson, October 25th through 27th. Go to azpreservation.org for more details on that. <clears throat> One of the perks of working here is getting to travel across the state and being shown places most people never get to see. Now, a few times over the years, I've been to places in northern Arizona or Verde Valley where someone would point to a building and say something like, that's the old Butterfield Stagecoach stop. And then I'd have to break the news to them that first, that building does not date to before the Civil War. And second, the Butterfield never went through their part of the state in the first place. But I, I think this came about because the Butterfield has worked its way deep into the pop cultural consciousness of the country, or at least the American West, in a similar way that John Ford's Westerns led people to believe that much of the West looked like Monument Valley. But today we're here to learn the truth about the Butterfield Stagecoach. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce Alicia Adolph from the Arizona Preservation Foundation. Hello, as Eric said, my name is Alicia and I'm the AmeriCorps Public Ally with Arizona Preservation Foundation. Um, and we are sort of the state pre statewide preservation organization. We work with um, local communities across Arizona to help them find the resources that they need to preserve their buildings and their resources. Um, and I'm excited to present you all to this webinar today. Um, a reminder that it's being recorded and will be up on our YouTube channel. And I'll, I will put the link to our YouTube channel in the chat. Um, and um, put your questions in the chat when you have them. And I will pass it over to Gerald Lamb. All right. Hi, everybody. So my name is Gerald Lamb. I'm a historian and documentary filmmaker in Southern Arizona. And and telling the, the big story that is Arizona and Arizona's history, one thing that I have yet to tell the story of is the Butterfield Trail, even though it passes right through kind of all of the, uh, the areas I normally work in, and particularly Vail, Arizona, it went right through there. And just this last year, th there's been renewed interest, and it's now, uh, by presidential decree, is a, a National Historic Trail. And so there's all this interest across the country creating a, uh, a like a trail association and um, really bringing the history of the Butterfield Trail out of myth, like uh, uh, Eric said, out of myth and bring it bring it to the present and to reality. Let's bring it to light. You know what what was the real history of the trail? What were its real impacts? And we have two amazing uh, we have an amazing ex uh, two amazing people who are experts in this and also kind of experts in leading the charge. Uh, here in Arizona to get that trail association up and running and start projects to bring to light more information about the trail and make it more publicly accessible. So our, our primary expert is uh, Gerald T. Arnold, and he has spent the last 50 years walking and researching the route and the history of the Butterfield Trail. Uh, he's authored numerous articles about the trail and he's also the author of the Butterfield Trail and Overland Mail Company in Arizona, 1858 to 1861, which was published in 2011. And it's kind of for Arizona, that's the definitive um, uh, you know, manuscript. Um, and Jerry is now leading uh, to work. He's, he's, he's working on establishing the uh, Arizona chapter of the Butterfield National Historic Trail Association, an organization collaborating with the National Park Service to document and interpret uh, this really important part of our nation's history and transportation history. We're also joined by Helen Erickson. Uh, she teaches preservation planning at the University of Arizona, where she also directs uh, collaborative student internships with the National Park Service. Uh, Helen serves as the National American uh, Society of Landscape Architects liaison to the American Historic American Landscape Survey. And she has also documented numerous historic landscapes, including the Homestead area of Valley's Caldera National Preserve, Faraway Ranch, the Chiricahua National Monument, 
the Fort Bliss Historic District, Camp uh, Navajo, and Fort Apache. And Helen is also um, the kind of, uh, I don't know, the, the co-champion of the Butterfield Trail um, uh, Association, getting that up and running uh, here in Arizona. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Jerry and Helen, and uh, let's learn more about Butterfield Trail. Okay, that would be Helen. And just give me a minute to uh, share my screen here. Okay. And um, Okay, I hope people can see this. Um, Gerald, perhaps you could confirm that it's actually up here. I can see it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, just for those of you that I haven't seen lately, the reason I'm wearing this bizarre eyewear is that I recently had a detached retina. It's almost well, but if I use both eyes, I get very confused, which is not going to be helpful. So um, to begin here, um, I got interested in the Butterfield Trail. Whoops, I put this on here and I'm sure it shows. Hang on, let me get that moved. Sorry for this. Get off. I hope I'll get it off. Not getting it anywhere here. Okay, that's gone, that's gone. Now I have to go back. Okay, try that one more time. Okay, we'll start that over again. Um, anyway, uh, several students of mine uh, and I were working on a cultural landscape report for Fort Bowie National Historic Site. And that park uh, includes Apache Pass, which is an area rife with Butterfield stories. And it brought me into touch with uh, Jerry, who of course is the expert here. A brief history, uh, in 1857, Congress awarded businessman and transportation entrepreneur John Butterfield a contract to establish an overland mail route between the Eastern United States and California. What became known as the Butterfield Overland Trail began from two Eastern cities on the Mississippi River, St. Louis, Missouri and Memphis, Tennessee. The trail followed a southerly path uh, through Missouri, uh, sorry, through a bunch of states, Missouri, Arkansas, Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona before heading north through California to San Francisco. Its arcing path across the southern part of the country gave it another name, the Oxbow Route. This southerly route allowed for year-round service. Starting in 1858, Butterfield stagecoaches left twice a week from both ends of the trail, carrying passengers and mail. Averaging about 100 miles a day, drivers were able to reach San Francisco in 25 days or less, or vice versa, of course. Uh, the Overland Mail provided a vital connection between the West and the rest of the United States. Previously, mail between East and California had relied on a twice monthly service across the Isthmus of Panama. Although the Butterfield Overland lasted only until 1861, it played an important role connecting our young nation in a time of growing tension between North and South. Less than three years after the service started, it was dis it disrupted by the Civil War. Arizona became for a very brief period a Confederate territory in 1861. Colonel Carlton and the California Column moved east along the trail to reclaim Arizona for the Union, a campaign that ended successfully in the Battle of Glorieta Pass, New Mexico in 1862. From that point on, Arizona remained part of the Union. The Butterfield National Historic Trail was signed into law on January 5th of this year joining a group of historic linear landscapes, which include the Oregon Trail and the Trail of Tears. 
Although the National Park Service will, in collaboration with the private Butterfield National Historic Trail Association, lead a planning effort to support the development of the trail as a whole. Uh, it will not actually be uh, owning any of this property that they do not already own. By the way, the uh, Trail Association is well worth joining if you are interested in keeping up with new developments. And I think Alesha has put that in the chat for us, the information. Uh, the trail crosses a mix of public and private land and private property will not be purchased as part of the undertaking. However, landowners who are willing to permit visitors to their section of the trail will have the option of certification which offers the benefits listed here. The Park Service will work with individuals to come up with a plan that works for them. More information on that is available online. So I'm going to turn this over to Jerry, who is our expert on the Arizona segment of the Butterfield Trail, as well as lots of other bits and pieces of trail across the US. He will be heading the Arizona chapter of the Butterfield National Historic Trail Association. And again, for approximately 50 years, he has walked and researched the length of the trail in Arizona. Okay, Jerry, it's over to you. Okay, first of all, I like the name of your organization because it's got preservation in it. It's something I've been uh, interested in for over 50 years is the preservation of that great, but little unknown, uh, it's, uh, it's surprising when you say Butterfield Trail, the people in Arizona, they go, what? But, you know, it's one of the great roads that still exists in Arizona. It's just a lot of people don't know about it. Now, the, um, this was, uh, like it says on the, on the screen, the first successful government-sanctioned road connecting the east to the west. Now, some people talk about the, uh, say, what about the San, to, uh, San Antonio to San Diego mail line, the Jackass Mail? Well, that went from San Antonio to, to uh, San Diego and didn't exactly connect the east to the west. As a matter of fact, they said it went from uh, the middle of nowhere to nowhere. So um, uh, this was really had a dual purpose, this trail. It wasn't just another stage line. It often annoys me when you oh, another old west stage line. But uh, it was the forerunner. They knew that Butterfield would find a way as a, a, like a reconnaissance in the military to find a way through the best way for a railroad that would that would really connect the east to the west. Okay, next. Here, did we lose him again? Um, I see him. I just don't hear him. Okay. Next slide. Oh. Pardon? Can Kate, you hear me? We lost you for a slide. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. You probably can't hear me. Um, I can hear you. I hear you. Okay. We have technical issues. Okay. So yeah. the slide that's up, Jerry, we missed this. We didn't you hear you. you did we you did miss not. the first slide? We missed this slide. The one oh, this one. Okay, I'm just starting. Okay, uh, the, what we really need to talk about is a little bit of the prehistory uh, because of Tucson. Tucson was the only organized settlement on the trail at, at the time of Butterfield. And uh, of course, this was part of New Spain in the early days. And um, what comes into... Uh, uh, importance here is, of course, uh, Juan Bautista Anza and his uh, two trips to try to connect um, the colony uh, at Monterey in California, uh, a land trail, because the ocean uh, voyage was really rough and uh, they really needed to have a land route. Now, he made two trips. The first one, he was about to go up to the uh, Gila River and along it, but the, uh, the Apaches were constantly hitting him. They, they uh, made a mess of the whole thing on, on his first Entrada. Uh, but he did, he, he did manage to get to California on the old uh, Camino del Diablo. And, uh, but he came back by way of the Gila River. And this uh, 
Well, he wanted to uh, uh, really meet the Pima, Maricopa, and the friendly tribes that way. His second entrada was both on uh, the south bank of the Gila River. And uh, of course, they, uh, the whole Spanish thing went to heck when uh, Napoleon started uh, 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 you know, causing problems and things were going downhill fast. There was a certain amount of um, uh, actually Mexican nationalism by now. And, uh, uh, and then the, uh, the Mexicans uh, finally uh, you know, won their nationalism. And you know, the Apaches were constantly hitting Tucson all the time, constantly hitting them. And uh, of course they did establish a, a presidio there. The, and the Mexicans, of course, they, they took that over. And uh, that leads us to the Gadsden Purchase of uh, 1854. Now, when Butterfield came through, there was only four years that that had been part of the United States. And really, I look at it as only two years because the uh, Mexicans uh, agreed to stay in the Presidio until 1856 to protect it until the Americans got there. Now, we can go to the next slide because I don't want to talk about this part of it too much. Now, this is a, a quick little slide of uh, the what was the Spanish Empire up to the Tucson Presidio. Now, you see that Tucson Presidio? Uh, that was the only organized settlement on the, on the Butterfield Trail. I mean, so all the rest of that south of there doesn't uh, mean anything at this point for the Butterfield Trail. So on to the next slide. Now, this is the great John Butterfield himself. I, I like this uh, drawing. A lot of people don't use it, I do, because it was from an, uh, an 1858 Frank Leslie's newspaper. It's just as he uh, mounted the box of the first stage heading west out of Tipton, Missouri. This is what he looked like. He was an old man then, <laughs> considered then. He was 57. Next slide. This is his monument in uh, uh, Utica, New York, where he was from and where he is now buried. And you know these, um, I, I guided some historians last year from Arkansas through this area, uh, Utica, New York and Rome, New York. And, and believe me, these graveyards are better than, than the uh, Boot Hill Cemetery. At least these, most of these are real. Uh, there are many, many of the pioneers of that stage line buried in those two cemeteries. Next slide. Now this has uh, been quite controversial. I won't get into it too heavy here because I wanna get into the good part showing you the trail. Now the, there's a lot of controversy about uh, Wells Fargo taking them over. They did not. Uh, so I, that's my annotations there in red. If you're Read the contract uh, completely and in the fine print, which a lot of people don't do. Now, all the contracts, all of them at that time for the Central Overland Trail and Southern Overland Trail had two parts to them. There were the contractors, the original bidders, and that's those seven I have shown from John Butterfield down to H. Spencer. They were the original contractors who bid on it and, and were being paid by the government. Now, who are the sureties? Now, people assume that these uh, were actually ones who had a participation, in, uh, you know, a, a physical hand in setting up the, uh, uh, the trail, but they didn't. These, uh, D.N. Barney there, he was the president of Wells Fargo and Company. But see, uh, they had a bank. And so all contracts had to have guarantors that it would not fail, that they would have the money. And that was their only purpose. Now, they did sit in on the boards, but they uh, three of those were Wells Fargo. But, uh, and uh, like I said, the Wells Fargo Bank was uh, loaned them money. It cost three and a half million dollars to build that line. That was a lot of money. But uh, we won't talk about this too much. It's quite a subject. It's very controversial, but they did not take over that line. They had a heavy, heavy influence in it. In, uh, you know, say backroom influence. They wanted them to carry exclusively their express parcels. Now express, express companies were not stagecoach companies. They had no experience in staging. So even though people talk about, 
oh, there were express companies, some of these were representatives, they were, because they wore other hats, but it had no part in this company. Express companies simply shipped parcels on other people's transportation. And that's what they jealously guarded. That was their connection, uh, you know, for some influence, background, uh, backroom influence. Next slide. Now, this is my drawing of the trail, which includes the old jackass mail line, I'll call it, it's easier to say that, the San Antonio to San Diego mail line. You can see that they actually traveled at the same time through 900 miles of the trail. Their part of the mail contract was canceled when Butterfield took over because they couldn't have redundant routes. And uh, that's why I show this, that explains some of, they ran at the same time. Uh, all, and. You know, it's, it's interesting that um, the jackass mail never had any stagecoaches. They had broken down wagons. And the best thing they had was called a, an ambulance. It was a ex-military ambulance. But you see up there at St. Louis going to Tipton, it went 60 miles by railroad first. And, uh, uh, and then you have that, that bifurcation from Memphis with this 12 mile route of railroad and on to Fort Smith. And that's where they, they combined uh, the mail and passengers onto a stage wagon from the stage coaches because now they're hitting the frontier all the way to uh, Los Angeles. That's 1920 miles of frontier they had to go through. Next slide. Now these two, the top one there is my drawing of uh, uh, Arizona. Now, isn't this interesting? You take a look there, look at the trail. If you were to drive I-10 and then at Casa Grande, go up to 238 and, and take I-8, you are through the same corridor as the Butterfield Trail. That's no coincidence. See, these uh, all trails and um, uh, railroads, roads, they try to find the easiest path through the environment. And so it's no coincidence that they're, uh, they're intertwined. Uh, you know, often when I'm driving I-10 up to uh, 238 and uh, I-8, I bore the heck out of my wife saying, hey, look over there. There's where <laughs> the line was. You, you can do that. You drive along there. You can literally do that all the way. Now, the bottom one is from Tucson over to the border. That's kind of interesting. Now, you have two environments in Arizona. From Tucson over to New Mexico, you have uh, a higher elevations. And it's like a rolling uh, prairie with grasslands. Now, when, when the um, Butterfield built the stations through here, you'll notice I have one, two, three, four uh, solid red ones. These were built in 1858. And it's interesting, uh, to Dragoon Springs Stage Station, that's right about in the center there, you see it, Dragoon Springs. That was the last of the 10 fortified stage stations. We'll get into this a little later on, but a brief explanation of this. Uh, there were at first only 17 stations built in Arizona or used. And then he went in backfilled uh, once it got going to make it more efficient. That's those two um, rectangles of Ewell's and San Simone right by the border. He put those in, in uh, uh, after. Why? Because they realized they needed a couple more stations. But it's interesting, they were of Adobe and not stone fortified as Apache Pass and Dragoon Spring Stage Station were. The reason for that was that's Apache territory and there was this apprehension of, uh, of uh, the Apache attack all the time. Uh, and so from Dragoon Springs into New Mexico, most of the structures were stone because of that, stone fortified. But once you get to um, uh, beyond there going east, you start to get into friendly uh, uh, Pima Maricopa territory. And so they, those were um, adobe stations. Uh, and also the environment, once you got to Tucson, heading all the way to the Colorado River, radically changed. You're now hitting the desert areas. North of Tucson was called the 90 mile desert. And, and then up towards uh, where Maricopa is now, there was the 40 mile desert. So you have two different distinct environments in Arizona. For these stations to deal with and, and the trail. Next slide. 
Now, there's been a lot of controversy about this over the years because the Conklins, who wrote their uh, monumental works, they did the pioneering effort in 1929, and it was published in 1947 by the Arthur H. Clarke. Now, they did the best they could. They admitted that um, they had no, uh, not very many primary references, and they had to take the word of the bards along the trail, and they actually stated they became skeptical of that. And it's funny, Conkling, um, one of the authors, he was from Albany, New York originally. And he said that his grandfather told him that, uh, uh, you know, the Overland Mail Company stage wagons of the style you're looking at were built by John Gould, which was his grandfather. Now, I found out that this was not true. And I wrote a very, uh, an article for the Carriage Journal about this and also for the Overland Journal. Um, but they were all made whether uh, they used the classic Concord stagecoach, I call them the Rolls Royces, on the both ends of the trail where there were settlements. From Tipton, Missouri to Fort Smith, Arkansas, and then from Los Angeles up to San Francisco, they used the classic uh, Rolls Royce, I call it. But in between the 1920 miles of uh, frontier, they needed something lighter through the heavy sand and going up the sides of the mesas. And um, this was, we have plenty of uh, primary source references, we know this, that they were all made by J, S, and E, A Abbott of Concord, New Hampshire. That's who uh, Butterfield contracted for 66 of these. Now he picked the Australian model, uh, which this is, but he had it modified to his specifications. Now they are unique. Now, people are, we've always been trying to locate uh, one of these. They don't exist. I hope uh, they find one someday. But the huge difference is take a look at the box in where the driver's seat is and the conductor. It is not elevated like in all the other stage wagons. That's a unique feature. Also, these uh, backs folded down and to make beds. You see a little leather strap there, they fold down. They had to sleep on these darn things. They traveled 24 hours a day for 25 days, and it was hell. <laughs> Next slide, please. Next. Okay. Now, this is the only known uh, photograph of a Butterfield stage wagon on the trail at the Texas-New Mexico border. And this was taken probably uh, January of 1861. It's a daguerreotype. And see, there it is. See, see the... Uh, a conductor and a driver, they're level with the passengers. That is unique. So if you're looking for one, you have to look for that. Now, my drawing is based on that and is exact scale model. And I have uh, um, sent it to uh, Doug Hansen of Hansen Wheel and Wagon Works, who's the expert in this. And he says, I was within a quarter inch of the exact, uh, well, it was a full model. Next. Now, this is a uh, Gila Ranch stage station. I have just, um, I sent it to Helen this morning to have a look at it. I finally came up with uh, Butterfield's uh, his stations. What they modeled them after was a standard. These were all through the Southwest. He didn't come up with this idea himself of a um, two parallel structures with a breezeway in between. It's, uh, if I had, uh, I just drew up a great one this week. I wish I could substitute it for this, but this is a basic floor plan. The reason for that basic uh, um, breezeway through the middle of these two adobe structures is uh, to keep them cool. It was, the, it was the old West air conditioning, I call it. Now, uh, perhaps to the right would have been domestic rooms and to are, uh, is the uh, the rooms for the stage and uh, for the uh, the station keeper? Okay, next uh, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Now I often say, well, uh, the cowboy hasn't been invented yet. There's a big discussion about exactly when it was, but he certainly hadn't arrived in Arizona. Uh, 
Jerry, we lost some of that. We lost you. Okay, here we go. Let's start again. In yeah. case you didn't get it, um, see, the cowboy hadn't uh, arrived in Arizona yet, so they had to use uh, who were the experts back then. Now, the Mexicans, by way, the Spaniards had been at. At this for a long time. They, they substitute cowboys until the cowboy came along. Because this is before the Civil War. I often say there were three eras to this. There is uh, before the Civil War, which I call the Old Old West. Then there's this dead spot in Arizona, the Civil War, and then there's the Old West after. Now this is the Old Old West. No cowboys yet. So they use the vaquero. They're often employed a couple of them at each uh, stage station. It varied. But they were the experts for the time. Next slide. Now this is interesting. First, you got the uh, what they there was always this perceived thing. Oh, the Indians are going to get us, and they're always looking over their shoulders. You know. Well, this didn't happen with butter. Uh, but the uh, now when you got beyond the Apache territory, you you run in. Let's hope he comes back. For those who have just tuned in, uh, Jerry is above the Arctic Circle. To the, uh, what is called the, uh... <laughs> Jerry, but anyway, onward. We're losing you again. Oh, really? Uh, so this slide with- Are we, are we, are we okay now? We're okay now. Yeah, because I have no problem there's no problem. At yeah, the problem is your transmission. At my end here, I see everything's hooked up and good. That may be. Can you hear me now? Yes. So take a look at this slide and then we'll move ahead. All right, I'll start again. These are the uh, chiefs of the, uh, of the Pima and the Maricopa. Now it was interesting, uh, Chief Juan Cheveria of the Maricopa stated in 1858 that the Maricopa did not know the color of a white man's blood the, uh, because they bragged about always being Again, to our audience, this is- Friends to the white man. I mean, So everyone, uh, it's going in and out because of Jerry's transmission. It's not a problem with your uh, reception. Oh boy. Well, Hello. Wherever... Oh boy. Do you think, uh, Jerry, maybe uh, we, sh we should try calling in to see if maybe the, the phone connection is stronger? Maybe we should at this point do that. Um, let's see if I can catch him here. Yeah, but I think, I mean, this is already a really fast, like this slide is really fascinating because this really undermines a lot of the myths of the American Old West or the old old West, and uh, that you know every single interaction between oh, Anglo's. Are and we on? Can, oh, oh boy! Hello. Perhaps you should call in because you keep going in and out now. Um, are you there?
I'm going to try calling him. Thank you all for being so patient. Sorry about this. Hi, Jerry, I think you better call in because we're, we're dropping you all the time. Okay. So you should call in and I'm still on uh, this uh, slide with the Maricopa Pima. Yes. Thank you. Okay, I think we're getting getting this changed over to telephone, which uh, which worked earlier. Um, they have been having problems with mudslides and rain, and um, this week everything seemed to improve. So Jerry optimistically decided to do this. Uh, through the through the internet, but it doesn't look like it's working today. So sorry. Oh, <laughs> yeah, he's checking a connection. So, okay, are you on? All right, I'll do that immediately. Zero, zero, six, eight, three, three. Hi, uh, Jerry. Now it seems to be perfectly. Okay, Jerry, can you hear us? 
can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? I'm on. I'm on. I'm on. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on the phone now. now. Okay. Can you hear me on the phone? How do we get rid of it? Sounds like an echo. I think you have to sign up. I'm just go on the phone now. So quit, quit the Zoom. Leave the meeting. Or actually, I think it is. You have to leave. You have to leave. You have to leave. You have to leave. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we have to. Mute your computer. Yes, it's, it's muted. It's muted. Now you got to turn the speakers on. Yeah, I think the only way this work is to just close out of the meeting. Mm -hmm. and just use the phone. Okay, you want me to close out? Yes. All right, now, how do I do that? Okay. Jerry, can you still hear us? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. This is perfect. All right. Now, uh, I've left the meeting. What I'm going to do is open my PowerPoint so I can follow. Okay. So once again, uh, we all apologize for this bad tech. Oh, okay. You can hear me now? I can hear you. Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, you're looking at the slide of the uh, Pima chief and the Maricopa chief. Is that correct? Correct. All right, here we go. Um, now, these, uh, uh, I call this an oasis of safety in the Southern Overland Trail. Because their nation, which is now uh, just south of Phoenix, um, that was uh, uh, they were a very friendly tribe to to all the all the travelers along the trail. The the great chief of the Maricopa, Juan Chavera, even said in 1858 that the uh, uh, Maricopa did not know the color of a white man's blood. They always protected them going through. Now many of the um, 49ers going through. Uh, said the same thing. They never would have made it to the Colorado River alive uh, unless it uh, uh, you know, was for the uh, uh, care of the uh, Pima and Maricopa. Because, you know, they've come 2,000 miles by this time, and, and they were, uh, their health was depleted, and uh, some were even starving, their cattle dying, and, uh, and uh, many of them had already died through uh, uh, cholera and typhoid along the trail. But this was an oasis safety where, where they stopped and recouped so they could head through the uh, western Arizona, which was declared by the uh, immigrants as the worst part of the entire trail. Next slide. Got it. 
Okay. Now, this is the uh, uh, J. Ross Brown uh, drew this in 1864, the Pima Maricopa. And you can see the women with their baskets there, got the produce. They grew all kinds of stuff, melons and, and uh, wheat. And uh, you can see them out there in the fields, right in the dead center there. They're, they're farming. And uh, they were awarded. Well, let's go to the next slide. Yes. Now. As you can see, this is the Gila River Indian Reservation, the present day map. And on there, I've annotated it with a black line at the bottom. That's the trail. You see three uh, red box, looks like letters, you know, uh, red boxes with an X through them. You got Maricopa Wells, Casablanca, and Sacaton. These were three of Butterfield stations on their nation. Now they sold hundreds of thousands of, of uh, pounds of, uh, or tons, I should say, of wheat uh, to the line. They, they really helped to supply the line. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Now, this is Dragoon Springs Stage Station, the only existing ruins of a Butterfield station in Arizona. And it's quite spectacular. I love it there. It's, that's the... Uh, uh, Kochi stronghold in the background. And uh, the two little yellow lines, I've drawn it on there. That's the gate. Uh, it still exists. You can still see the uh, when you get, get into the uh, station, the floor plan, even where the rooms were. Uh, it still has a pretty good outline of what that stone stage station was. Like I said, this was the last of the 10 fortified stone stage stations because it's at the edge, uh, pretty much at the edge of the Apache territory. See, they were on the raid. These were on the raiding trails of the Apache going into, uh, uh, Mexico. And, uh, this is going to be the centerpiece in Arizona. Now we've already, um, uh, uh, David Mahalik is the, um, archeologist for this area. And, uh, what's going to happen here? All of, uh, in, this is kind of a sacred place to me. Um, those four, mounds of rocks you see in the lower left there those are rock cairns supposedly covering graves there's a great deal of controversy about this the, those uh we have five photos from 1898 uh, up to mine in 1970 those rock cairns have been uh deconstructed and reconstructed so many times we don't know who's where we're not even sure about the uh markers that were carved out there in 1862 by the my, from the Confederate battle with the Apaches there. We're not even sure they're on the same pile of rocks. There's good reasons for this. Uh, the Conklins actually photographed the Sergeant um, Fords on top of one of these piles askew, like it was picked up and put there. So there's so much controversy about this. Uh, we really feel that everything should be removed, that, that um, marker, the interpretive marker in the lower left there, which is got misinformation on it. Donaldson is not buried there. Uh, I mean, the, uh, he was a Confederate, only joined two days before he got killed in 1862, but he's buried uh, northwest of Tucson. We have information for that. And uh, probably two of those rock cairns cover the Butterfield uh uh, three Butterfield employees that were massacred there during the building of the administration on September 9th, 1861, or 1858, excuse me. Um, but the point is, we cannot definitively identify who's buried where. So what uh, uh, appears to be going to happen, uh, we, we all come into agreement on this, everything's going to be removed, all those markers, because that's, nothing should be there. This is kind of hollowed ground. In and out by the road, there will be a kiosk. This is not definite yet, but uh, it's, it's in the wind, uh, where the explanation for all this will be. It'll be a generic um, panel for who died there and are buried in the immediate vicinity, but we don't know exactly where. They're the three Butterfield employees, uh, the Confederate Sergeant Ford, and a Mexican-American uh, boy named Ricardo, and an arm and a head. <laughs> The, of course, that's uh, Silas St. John's uh, amputated arm. 
they amputated it right there during uh, after the massacre. Now, there's often said that there's four Confederates here. There were not. We have, uh, uh, it's quite a controversy about that. I've written about it, and um, if you wish to, I can uh, point you to my article in Desert Tracks about it. But uh, there are no Confederates there, believe it or not, because Sergeant Ford's, uh, what they think was his uh, grave, I have the uh, National Forest Service desecration report. 1967, the rock cairn was removed and the body is gone. Nobody knows why, or we're not even sure if it was Sergeant Ford because there's quite of a ambiguous information about this. Uh, well, uh, I've uh, talked about that quite a bit because that, like I said, is going to be the centerpiece in Arizona. No other uh, station in ruins exists. Sometimes they talk about the one at Apache Pass, no. That uh, the foundation there is on top of the old Butterfield station because uh, um, uh, the fellow who uh, uh, was the uh, station manager there, he came back in, uh, in Tevis, his name was, he came back in 1880 and built a trading post there out of the old rock. So what you're seeing is his trading post on top of the old site. Okay, next slide. Now, this is a, a great drawing, 1860, a guy named Grossvenor, Grossvenor uh, who was on the way to the Santa Rita mine south to, of uh, Tucson, was on a Butterfield stage in 1860, and he drew this. And bingo, there you got it. And uh, this is more great information for our, um, our reconstruction of this, which is what we're going to do in drawing. And uh, there was a... Um, a text with this explaining, uh, see, yeah, look in the lower left there, those two mounds, those are the Butterfield graves. Now they look like they're head to toe. This caused a lot of confusion. They're not. At the ground level, they're staggered and they look that way at ground level. If you if you bend down and pull back a ways. I mean, even Silas St. John says his amputated arm is buried between those graves. So we know there's a space there. But boy, this has caused a lot of controversy. But this is what it looked like. Next slide. Now this is entering Arizona. This is, uh, you're looking towards the New Mexico border in the mountains. And what you have, this is, uh, boy, look how different this is. If you go out in Western Arizona, boy, is it different with uh, the desert and the, and the volcanic plains there. But um, uh, this is San Simone Stage Station is just across the river. You're looking at the dry bed of the San uh, San Simone River. On the opposite bank was San Simone Stage Station, Adobe Stage Station. Now, this is an actual eroded part of the trail. There's very little of that can be seen in eastern Arizona, but th this is a very good second. There was a wooden bridge across there, one of the two wooden bridges, but you, but you can see how it's eroded, uh, and it's going to disappear in time like all of it, unfortunately. But this was the first station in Arizona, San Simone. And by the way, uh, there is a Confederate buried here. Uh, 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 Benjamin Mayo, Private Benjamin Mayo, when, when um, the Confederates were coming in, uh, Captain Sherrod Hunter was leading them in with 63 registered Confederates. Uh, they hit some bad weather up there in New Mexico. A lot of people don't realize you get some horrendous weather up there. And one of them died here of uh, exposure. And he's buried someplace in the vicinity here. And, you know, all of these stations have many burials by them. A lot we won't know. Some we do. I keep finding references for more and more. But every one of them has people buried by them. Because uh, this was, uh, was a bad trip, I'll tell you. Now, let's get into the fun parts here. Now, this was literally a highway across Arizona. And... This is, uh, you know, the preservation thing about this. What you're looking at are two different sections of the trail. It's what I call the primary artifact. These need preserving. To the right is a fascinating one. That's in the 40-mile desert southwest of Phoenix. Now, isn't that interesting? Now, look right at the bottom. You see this? Here's what happens. Take December. Now, you got a desert. How the heck does it preserve a, a trail? 
If you take December, you all know that 75 degrees in a day, and it can get down, you'll see ice on your bucket in the morning if you're camping out there. You have alkali dust in some clay, fine clay in the desert. And you get a 4,000 pound wagon with its iron rimmed wheels. And that is now wetted by the dew. And it rolls over and packs it down. And up comes the big fire in the kiln called the sun. And it banks it, bakes it hard, just like pottery. And, and it, you keep doing that, you get these actual hard, hard service that's preserved today. You, you say, otherwise, sand. You say, how the heck can that happen? Well, that's how it happened. If you look in the lower part, you see those serrations? That's actually from the wheels, the wheel ruts. But now there's two pillars there. This is, this, they put, should put a fence around this. Because in the center was not packed down. So old Mother Nature wrote it away. You know what? I measured uh, on those uh, two pillars. It's 62 inches center to center. That happens to be the dimensions of Butterfield's uh, uh, stage wagon wheels. But he uh, was not there that much to do this. There were wagons, you know, wagon trains and military on there with their wagons. But somehow the average must have been 62 inches because that's what it measures. Now to the left is um, not too, about six miles east of Gila Bend, Arizona. You notice how that's slanted? That is actually turnpiking. Now Butterfield in upstate New York, he was running on turnpikes. It's, they had those in England. And of course, they were usually toll roads, but there was a special way that they built them. Now, uh, I found out that James V. Leach, when he went through here in 1858, uh, just about the time that Butterfield was a start, he actually had equipment with him. I have his handwritten notes. There's thousands of pages. And there's a list of equipment. They're on the bottom there. He had plows, scrapers, and ditchers with him, six of them each. And this particular one wasn't a mound with a ditch on each side. Sometimes he slanted them. That's what this is in a ditch on the left. And then they ditched it. They did that in areas that were uh, a little more wet than others to channel off the water to preserve the trail. There's a number of sections over in Texas and uh, just above Mesilla in New Mexico. They also did this. But they did have their trail building techniques. Now that that shows that other one a little bit better, but uh, this is a they ought to put a fence around that. That's that's in the Sonoran Desert National Monument in the Forty Mile Desert. Next one, ah, this one. Uh, let me ask: Is uh, uh, I hope everyone can still hear me. That's possible. But anyway. Uh, this one, yeah, this is on the Oatman, uh, Oatman, uh, flats going up from the Oatman grave. It shows the two trails. One is the ruined immigrant trail. And then to the, uh, bottom there is Leach's improved trail. That's the one that, that Butterfield used. Now, this is a, a, a famous water hole that's on Sentinel Plain. Jerry, uh, I'm not far. I, Hello? I, Jerry, I. Yes. Uh, okay, I think I've figured it out. I've got the slide up of the water hole. Okay. Did, did you get the rest that I was talking about? Well, let's, let's go back one okay. then. Do you understand? Okay. So did you get that? Uh, did you get it about the um, uh, the two trails coming up the side? Yes, that's it. Oh, all right. Now, let's, okay, then let's go to the next one, which is slide twenty-two. Uh, you see two trails side by side. Do you see that? Yes. All right. Now my explanation for that. This is really cool. The one on the left is James B. Leach's trail in 1858 when he was trying to improve the trail. He had a contract to. And to the right is the immigrant trail. That's only 11 feet wide. Now, how do I know that the one to the left is, is Leach's road? 
because he describes it exactly. They roll the rocks back to 18 feet, and that's what that is. So we know that's Leach's trail. But you get a section. I don't know why they did this parallel like that. I have no ex- and we, uh, in talking to different people about it, it might have been a passing point because the wagon trains came up behind each other, and, and it took them hours to pass if one was faster than the other. It might have been something along those lines. They anticipated that. Okay, the next slide. That's the water hole, not too far from, from that section of the trail I just showed you. Down in that water hole, the Native Americans use that for so- thousands of years. There are petroglyphs everywhere down in there. And, uh, and everybody using the trail, this was an emergency hole. If the water wasn't there, they're dead. But you can see there's water at this time, but it's fascinating down there. There's petroglyphs everywhere. And then there's names of the 49ers. To the right, you see uh, Perry Randall. He's from Texas. But his famous relative, O.W. Randall, left the signature there in 1849. And you see to the left of it, that's a thousands of year old petroglyph. Now, these are some of the things uh, I can't tell you where these are, have to keep these secret, but they're out there. Now, the upper left was a, a, a real thrill to find. It's up to 5,000 years old. It's an addle, addle point. Mm-hmm. And the thing about this trail was um, uh, a side light, to, well, not a side light, but this will explain this. Uh, a few miles to the east is Painted Rocks uh, a petroglyph site. Now, Archaeology Southwest has proposed this as a, as a new national monument called the Great Bend of the Gila. I've been working with them and writing them re- reports for years, and I helped. Uh, I ground-proofed part of the trail through there with them. And uh, we were around the campfire one night talking, you know, Dr. Aaron Wright with Archaeology Southwest and one of their other uh, archaeologists, a uh, great fellow called Skylar Begay, a young Navajo fellow. And I said, you know, uh, the trail they were following along the south bank of the Gila was mentioned in 1846 by uh, Captain Johnson with Kearney's Army of the West. And, and he said they were following a well-beaten Indian trail that connect all the old ruins of the Indian villages. And I kept seeing this. And really, what everybody followed after, I asked him, you know, I, I, I asked uh, Aaron, I says, well, that was the... Um, Ancient Indian Highway to the Sea of Cortez, connecting all the villages, and they agreed. So really what the uh, uh, the pioneers, uh, Butterfield and the rest of them were following, was that trail. That, that was kind of the genesis for it. And that um, Adelaide point, I have to keep it a secret again, is out in that area proving it. Now, to the bottom, you'll see that white round rock. That is a hammer, a Native American hammer hidden in the rocks, uh, someplace along the trail. Can't tell you where again, but, you know, in reserve for when they, <laughs> they didn't have to carry it with them, probably. Now, to the lower uh, right, you see pottery, lots of pottery. There was, um, um, I don't really understand a lot of this, but along their trails, there's always, pot- this happened to be a, a big concentration of it. And now to the upper right, that is probably, you see a, um, a Spanish-style cross and symbols and a name below it. That's probably Juan Bautista Enza, because he came right through here, too. Now, this is a, um, around Sears Point. That's a National Historic Site in, in western Arizona. But the trail went around the front of that point until... Leach built this road you're looking at a mile and a half south across the mesa so they wouldn't have to drag around that heavy sand. And it saved a little bit of a distance. This is start part of the preserved trail. You can see the, uh, if you got close to those rocks, you'd see the iron, the serrations. I took Doug Hawking and uh, Dan Judkins on a little walk here and showed them some of the artifacts. Again, I can't tell where, uh, especially from possibly the California column of a a number of unspent bullets, buttons, et cetera. Now, last but not least, 
These are some of the artifacts along the trail that are interesting. And I'll tell you something about this. Now, working with Archaeology Southwest, uh, they told me how to preserve these from prying eyes, so to speak. We want them left there. But on the upper left, what do you got? It's called a mouth harp. There's a number of these along the trail. They were sitting on their boxes or wagon train, twanging away, entertaining themselves. In the middle there is a mule shoe. Nine out of ten uh, shoes you see out there are mule. Mules were the main beast of burden for everything. Even even Butterfield used them. There were half broken wild mules. Upper right, there you go. That's probably California column time. You have a, a, a military button, and we think it's a 54 caliber sharps. Now, number three there, that's a pen knife. Now, I've written articles about this, trying to humanize the trail um, of how that little pen knife was used to sharpen uh, a, a turkey feather so that they could write their journals. Um, as a matter of fact, in this month's uh, Desert Tracks, uh, that number four, you look to the left of it, you'll see a, uh, a burr and a ribbit, broken burr and a, and a ring on the a harness. They often had to stop and, and uh, repair their harnesses because they dry out there in the relative humidity, crack and break. And uh, uh, so they see these rivets and burrs all along the trail. Lower left, 1864, Rorman Canteen, military, dropped by probably the California Column. And believe me, it won't be found. That's a long story. Now that, that nail, number six, that's got a mark on it. Maker's mark. You know, a lot of these had a, the mark of globe manufacturing. They made them for the military, and they came. They were from the Waterville Arsenal in, in uh, Troy, New York, or in Water, well, right near Troy in Waterville, and they'd send them out in these little pegs of uh, for the military. Now, the lower right, that's an 1850s or 60s half dollar, and it's right in the trail, and it's cupped up because the iron wheels have uh, uh, over, so I couldn't see the date. But believe me, it's well hidden. Nobody will find it. Now, Helen, are you there? I'm here. Next. Oh, oh uh, I, think, uh, I think that's it. Yep, that is it. So. <laughs> okay. Now, now, did it all go over okay? Did you hear me? <laughs> oh, Jerry. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Let yeah. Me... Yeah, that's great. Now, if there's any, yeah, if there's any questions, uh, you know, like I said, this is um, this trail is, is was so underrated. It's uh, finally recognized by um, Frank Norris with the National Park Service, who I've done a lot of work uh, for about the trail, and for Aaron Mayer. The, the uh, you know, because they always looked at this as another shoot 'em up old west type of thing, but this wasn't. This was a unique trail, and Arizona has one of the best parts of it that has to be preserved in all 2,700 miles. It's, if you could walk it out there, it's spectacular. It's a pristine trail, a totally unworn in the Western Arizona, and you'll swear a wagon train's gonna run over you, <laughs> turn around. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, yeah Jerry, great. That was, that was fantastic, thank you for the presentation and thanks for powering through all the technical <laughs> challenges. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I hope I, I, you know, it's a little embarrassing to me. I wanted it to be better, but what are you going to do? You know, well, it's, you know, technology, <laughs> but I, I think yeah. you're absolutely right. I mean, from what you're talking about is a very different reality, a very different history of the West than is kind of the common myth. Uh, yeah, may I interject about that? You know, just to show you a point, what, what you're saying exactly. And I'm glad that point. Now, I was talking to a, uh, a professor up at the University of Arkansas about this. And um, I told him, I said, there, there's so many myths about this. It's, it's incredible about Butterfield. And, and, you know, it's something I've been fighting for over 50 years. And I says, we need to get the truth out. And he said, well, we need to talk about the old stuff. In, uh, to get people, keep people's interest and then get this in. And I said, well, here's the problem. If you knew the Butterfield history, uh, um, then you'd, you'd know that there were things just as interesting, humorous in other tales to get people's interest. And there are. I mean, 
for instance, when, I'll give you an example. When I wind up my um, talks in Arizona, and which I've given many, I often read, it's a short paragraph from a correspondent who was on a Butterfield stage, and he talks about Hell Roaring Jackson. It was just north of Tucson. They were on a Butterfield stage wagon, and he'd lost, he woke up and he lost, found his hat was gone. And he started swearing, and he said uh, he never repeated the same swear word twice and, and, and words that weren't in the good book, you know. And there's some great uh, stories about Butterfield. It's just not the old shoot 'em up bang bang stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's that's fascinating. Um, I'm trying to. Uh, I had a question and it and it, and it totally uh, uh, went out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry yeah. about that. No, it's okay. Maybe no, it'll pop. It, yeah, it's it's just uh, it is a really fascinating um, way, and and hopefully, and that's something that I I hope that our project, you know, if we get funded and and can do that is really try and tell this story um, for what it is, which I actually think is a much more interesting history because I think the particularly that um, Arizona history before the Civil War is just so different. It's so different than kind of the uh, westerns uh, that a lot that of us grew up on, and it's and, yeah. and I think yeah. the way you're describing it is the old old West. Um, that, that's why I say that there's three distinct. Uh, completely different eras, you know. You know, it is another thing about this. When I was uh, talking with uh, the boys with Archaeology Southwest when I was out in the desert with them, that I have come to the conclusion that that 12,000 year or maybe more history, we don't know about how long the natives been here, up to the time when the trail ended in 1880 because of railroad. It was a continuous immigration. There wasn't you know, the, the Americans and, and the natives, and it was, it's a continuous line that's all interconnected. And, you know, I often say it's, it's all about our American journey. You know, it's, it's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. So I am wondering if people who are here have questions, Gerald. Yeah. Uh, I hope there's many because there's a lot of myths. <laughs> yeah, in the chat, JT asks, "Can we hear the story behind the canteen?" Oh, the canteen. Now, um, that because of its day, it's it's a, called a bullseye canteen. It's definitely military. And uh, see, the California column when they came in in 1862 in Arizona to chase the Confederates out. Um, the uh, um, they actually hung around to, I think they were decommissioned in 1866. Now it's undoubtedly connected to them because I have other um, artifacts out there. Now that same slide in the upper right hand corner, you see a military button in, in an 18 or a 54 caliber Sharps rifle. That's what was issued to them. So there's some um, pretty good evidence that's with the California column. And, um, well, how I found that, and, you know, I've been walking that desert for 53 years. And uh, I figured something out, you know, the military would do, I was in the military, so it's, it's helped me out, you know, in understanding reconnaissance, et cetera, et cetera, and how they did things. And I don't want to get into the exact details about this, but I figured there was an alternate trail he took to some place, the shortcut, and I was right. And I found it uh, uh, along there. You know, it's some of the things, you know, I'm like Moses in the desert wandering around. I I don't just follow the trail. I zigzag to the left and right up to a mile because uh, of uh, other things happened, you know, where people would camp trying to hide from the Apache at night. Uh, There's many, many reasons. Even uh, by the water hole, there's a uh, a huge grounds there with a common wagon train camping area. There's still a lot of... uh, of artifacts uh, there. And there was, because of my military training, I said, wait a minute, there's a slight rise to the right there. I went up top and sure enough, that's where they had their lookouts because they could actually see the edge of Sentinel Plain where the uh, open massacre was. And if, uh, say, some hostiles were coming up over the edge. But, you know, it's, uh, it's given me a lot of insight from my background. And you keep wandering out the desert there, 
we'll never see it all. I mean, I, I've been working at it for 53 years, and it's uh, there's still a lot out there. The, the question I had just came to me, and I think you, you spoke to it a little bit here. It, it sounds like really apart from a few instances of violence, the trail was largely peaceful and that there was a constant maybe concern about Apache, but it seems like maybe that wasn't. Boy, that, that, that's a tremendously interesting subject to us, you know. Now, Butterfield was an absolute genius. He was the only one who could have pulled this off. There's, there's absolutely no doubt. He had, um, you know, this, this links into what you're saying. Um, he had a way of appeasing, you know, appeasing the natives. There's two sides to it. The Apache uh, were very pragmatic, and also Butterfield would appease the natives. Now, in his special instructions, number 18, it said, have no intercourse with the Indians. Leave them alone. Do not annoy them. <laughs> and and so here's an example at Picacho Pass Stage Station north of Tucson 15 Apache come up to the station and there's four employees there and they say we want corn so they give them the corn he said we want that little stove to cook it in they give them the stove oh we like those shiny buckles on those harnesses here take them you know what are they going to do anyway <laughs> <laughs> but see, he did that readily. He would appease them. He would, uh, you know, give them things. And the Apache were one of the most pragmatic Indians that they fascinate me, you know, because they had their own military science. Now, I was in the command headquarters with 7th Army, so I know a little bit about that type of military science. And there's parallels here. They were the masters of, of uh, warfare and uh, warriors and trackers. They, they were unbelievable. And um, but they were pragmatic. They would only steal at night in general and attack in the daytime and only when there was an advantage. Sometimes they guessed wrong and they would always attack from the high places when they could. But now Butterfield's coming through. There was an uneasy peace with the Apache, even in even in Apache Pass. You know, they were given supplies by uh, uh, an Indian agent named Steck. You know, up until the Bascom affair, which turned everything in February 4th, 1860, uh, 1861. But anyway, uh, they, it is felt that uh, if they atta attack the stagecoach, now that's a federal mail line, it would bring in the troops. So they didn't. Now, they did kill some of Butterfield's employees, perhaps not knowing that they were. Like uh, west of Gila Ranch Stage Station, they killed one of Butterfield's freighters. Now he's on a wagon with supplies. So they're going to know it's Butterfield? Who knows? You know. So uh, some of Butterfield's employees got killed that way, but never on the stages. They never touched the stages, except during the Bascom affair. Uh, they were very pragmatic Indian. And they would steal the mules from uh, uh, the stage stations at night. And, you know, Butterfield just resupply them you know, restock the shelves the next morning, so to speak. And it was just part of the appeasement of the patches. Uh, it was absolutely a brilliant exercise that John uh, Butterfield conducted. That's fascinating. Do you have any other, uh, any other questions from the audience you can put in the chat or? I wanted to ask Helen again where to submit the membership application. Okay, um, I'm. Uh, were you able to find it? Were you able to upload it to Lesha? Yes, I did put it the link to it in the chat. Um, I just wasn't sure. I want to clarify where to sure. submit it. Okay, uh, it actually has the information on the form, oh. and. Um, it is actually, uh, unfortunately, you can have to send it by snail mail. There is no, uh, there is no uh, way to do this online. But I think it's, if you're interested in this, it's worth keeping in touch with that group. They also have a Facebook page. So if you look for it on Facebook, you'll get some more information there. This is an interesting partnership between the Park Service and the private group. And um, 
I hope that it's going to be a successful partnership. As I say, Gerald is going to be leading this up in Arizona. And uh, I know some of the other people who are on this, uh, who are on this webinar, uh, Courtney Rose, uh, Doug Hawking, uh, Dave Mahalik. I'm looking to see what else I have here. But uh, there are people who are working together to make this chapter in Arizona work. So uh, let us know if, uh, if you want more information about that. There will be a meeting in Tucson in January, the end of January. And uh, again, we're collecting email addresses to make sure that everybody who's interested can join that. And it looks like uh, Carlos Lozano looks like you raised your hand and you can go ahead and looks like you're unmuted if you wanted to ask your question or. Yeah, thanks. Can you uh, can you hear me OK? Sounds good. Good. Uh, yeah, Gerald, thanks for the presentation. You've you've uh, you've walked uh, the the trail. How much of that land is is used for for recreation? And I'm just wondering if a, if a four wheel drive could just wipe out an extant portion of the of the trail, uh, you know, as we speak right now. And and what is the best practice for protecting it? I'm wondering if you put up a fence, does that just attract yeah. more vandalism or or what's how? I just worry when I see these these uh, res historic resources just sitting out in the middle of nowhere with no protection. Well, you you hit a subject dear to my heart. You know, and I'm out there with my wife sometimes. She says, I wish I had a bazooka because she see those ATVs and about to do what <laughs> some of the destruction you're talking about. But, you know, in my 53 years of walking that trail, all 400 miles of it through Arizona, some areas, especially the 40 mile desert and the western half of Arizona, where it is beautifully preserved. Like I said, the original tracks are, are the prime artifact and no vehicle should travel on those tracks. Now, here's what I've seen over the years. In the 40 mile uh, desert, southwest of Phoenix in the Sonoran Desert National Monument. Now, they closed that off, I think around 2007, because the ATVs were playing the heck out there, ruining everything. And uh, so what they did was close it, and then they tried to um, uh, fix up some of the areas. It's, it's open again. But uh, uh, there are what I call the cowboy trails developed in the 20s and before. These are, are uh, many of them are now BLM marked roads. They got the carcinite marker there, that brown marker with a number on it. And you, you are required to stay strictly on that road. Now you can go within 50 feet off of it to camp uh, in, in areas, as you know, on the federal lands. You can even do it in the Sonoran Desert National Monument. But to um, the, the road there, goes parallel, fortunately, to the original trail. So it's preserved, the, the cowboy road, as I call it, and it's the BLM road now. So there is that. And um, on the Sentinel Plain, it's the same thing. They have marked BLM roads. Uh, unfortunately, the old cowboy road sometimes went on top of the old trail. I can't do anything about that. And uh, you see that on the Sentinel Plain a little bit, but not much. But that's one of the most fascinating five mile sections there is right by Oatman Flat and, and the uh, Petroglyph National Monument, where the trail is right in front of that. Now, it's a pet peeve that, you know, Aaron, Aaron Wright uh, with Archaeology Southwest and she and both kind of sit around the fire. Good old boy talk <laughs> about these markers. They they need to be replaced. Most of them simply need updating because the information they had was uh, not to cool back then, but some of it shouldn't have been there in the first place, quite frankly. The ones at Sears Point, a national historic site out there in western Arizona, the ones about Butterfield are totally mythological. Every word on them is hardly a truth, a word of truth on them, and uh, they will be replaced. But like I said, the, uh, the trail, is, that's a complicated issue you're talking about. And it's also 
the argument is, is we do this, we're going to bring more people in. But, you know, it's a gray area. To, and we, can, we can't come up with a black and white solution. We need to get the history to the public. But yet, how do we preserve that history? Because there's always a few nefarious people around. You know, doing things. It's it's um, it's a hard thing to answer, really. It, but from my experience, it's fairly well covered because of the BLM roads that parallel them. And, and you know, fifty one percent of the trail is on ranch land and, and private property. So, uh, but Western Arizona is the best section in all twenty seven hundred miles. I swear, it is spectacular. I'd love to take you out there. Actually, Courtney Rose is on this call, and Courtney has worked with site stewards, and we have talked about how we could possibly organize site stewards in terms of the trail. So, Courtney, can you give us some good advice on this? Hi, everyone. Um, well, we would need to we would need to coordinate with the site stewards to monitor, and maybe at certain uh, points where a lot of people are, um, where it's very visible and there are a lot of people who want to use the trails, like for instance, the one in the Cienega Creek Natural Preserve, the Arizona Trail is really close to it. So, you know, there is that, that issue of wanting to get the information out and have everyone enjoy it, but at the same time, preserve and, and be sure that there isn't any um, additional um, disturbance of the area. And there's so many um, cultural resources around around the um, station, the stage station too. Um, it's and it's an absolutely beautiful area. So um, yes, I do work with the um, Arizona State Parks. Uh, site stewards, and there is a team that um, regularly uh, monitors um, areas that would include the um, the Butterfield Stage Station and the Sienega Creek Natural Preserve. So we could we could organize that in the future. Thank you. That would be great. Thank you, Helen. Do we have other questions out there? Yeah, there's another question here from Michelle. Uh, what prompted your interest in the trail over 53 years ago? And then that's the a good question. question. Yeah, so what that's is a good your question. interest? Well, uh, back in the 60s, I was on the Apollo 11 project. I was the lead microelectronics designer for the visual space flight uh, simulator. They trained on to go to the moon. Now, after that, I worked on many research and development jobs, one a top secret one out there in, near Phoenix. In 1970. And of course, uh, wife and I wanted to go out in the desert and camp. We go out in that 40 mile desert and and uh, she cooking breakfast and I walk around and she look at that, what it looks like some old ruts here and you know, and I got interested in it. And, wow, it's the old Southern Overland Trail, also known as the Butterfield Trail. And then John Butterfield? Well, I was brought up in the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains in northern New York, upstate New York only a hundred miles from John Butterfield's home. So it kind of piqued my interest and I started researching it and uh, uh, just kind of got out of hand, you know, until um, uh, I've written two books on it. My first one was in 73. It was nothing more than a uh, atlas based on the Conklings. Now they did the best they could, but there were a lot of um, things in there, uh, you know, uh, that weren't, True, it's not their fault, it's just the information they had at the time. You know, the, the, some of the stations I had were two and a half miles off. But then uh, I kept working at it, working at it, finding more information so that uh, I now know that those 26 stage stations, I can locate every one of them plus or minus 100 feet. And uh, some of the most of them do not exist in any way that Gila River, boy, it ravaged them, you know. And uh, especially this upstate New York connection. I often say in my uh, um, presentations, this was a New York State trail. And they kind of look at me, you know, it didn't come out of New York State, but everything, their employees, you know, Buckley, William Buckley, uh, who was from uh, the superintendent from El Paso to Tucson was from Watertown, New York. And then the uh, superintendent who built the stations 
from Tucson to San Francisco and was a superintendent was from Rome, New York, only 12 miles from Butterfield's home. Most of the stage drivers were, were from upstate New York. They were not like in Ralph Moody's book, a stagecoach West, rough, tough frontiersman. He did a, you know, he didn't do a lot of research. They, they were upstate New Yorkers. I have their names. I have all the ones names that, that were in Arizona. Five of the stage stations in Arizona have New York state names. When you drive to a, a Yuma, an I-8, you will see a Mohawk Valley cutoff, Stanwix. Those are upstate New York names. Stanwix, Marcus L. Kenyon, the superintendent who built those stations through there, he ran Stanwix Hall Hotel in Rome, New York. See, these are all, uh, this is a strong New York state connection. That's, that's what really got me interested. And I got kind of crazy about it and then kind of fanatical and walking that trail and seeing it and knowing it's, uh, you know, uh, they, they haven't noticed this. I don't know why the Central Overland Trail, Lewis and Clark, they get all the uh, attention. And what the heck's wrong with the Butterfield Trail? It was, uh, it needs attention. Alesha, I think we're running out of time. Do you have any closing um, comments here? Yes, I did want to say thank you all for being here today and to keep an eye out. Our next book club meeting is um, August 15th. We'll, we'll be reading The City We Became by N.K. Jemison. And then our next webinar will be August 10th on Asian American history in Arizona. And you can Look out for that. Um, Gerald, do you have any closing thoughts? Oh, uh, I, I could talk forever, so I think we'll have to cut it off here. We'll, we'll get it all out eventually. Yes, I have a closing remark, actually. I'm sure Gerald <laughs> would have said this. We are working on a story map, which we hope will be available by the fall, that will give uh, an example of the actual route and um, and also if we're if we get the grant that we're looking for get some of Gerald's videography and uh, it's you know one of those ongoing projects but we should at least have a skeleton mount by the fall and Michelle has a question Michelle do you want to unmute yourself oh no it wasn't a question. We're clapping hands. But applause, applause. Thank oh. you very much. <laughs> oh, okay. I have one last comment. I will be out there as I am every year from January 1st to April 1st. I'll be at that meeting in Tucson. And also, I think I'm going to have another look at Seneca Stage Station, which you call Seneca Stage Station. <laughs> but if you'll call it Seneca, that's an interesting little spot there, you know because uh, the uh, railroad's right over the station. There's some ruins there, but it's difficult to tell what was Butterfield. We'll, we'll never really know, but it's an interesting spot. And I guess... But I'll, I'll, I'll be out there, like I said, if anybody wants to meet with me or, or anything you got going, I'll try to make time to do it. I'll be there for three months. I also see that Doug Hawking is doing a trip on August 5th, if anyone's crazy enough to go out in the heat. Uh, <laughs> it's not a very long walk, Alan. Okay, so <laughs> a few hundred feet, <laughs> and we'll go into the cool of Colossal Cave. Um, you've got a number of stories that relate to that area: two train robberies, um, the buried treasure of Colossal Cave, and then Seneca Station is right there. So. We'll go to Seneca Station and then on the Colossal Cave. Okay. Alessia, back to you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, and I hope you have a great day and weekend. And I hope to see you at our next webinar. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>